Hi everyone, welcome back to AI News. My name is Ethan, if you still remember me. Uh, today we have an amazing guest. This guest is actually what AI News, me and Felicia and Priscilla pray for, to, uh, for him to show up. And uh, his name is? J. Emilio Martinez. All right. right Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about yourself before we start anything? Well, right now I'm uh, producing a show called Hashtag Fake News Show <laughs> for Lore.TV. It's going to be up on Lore.TV. It's L-O-O-R. And uh, we're on a mission to save comedy from cancel culture. And uh, in my journeys to help expand the show, I got involved with politics, and the next thing you know, I'm signed up to run for uh, Congress. Yes, yeah. he is running for which district? Uh, California 30, which is currently Adam Schiff's district. It hits like Burbank, Glendale, Hollywood, West Hollywood, goes down uh, actually to like Mid Wilshire, and then stretches all the way back up to uh, Tahunga and uh, Sunland. Yeah. Yeah, who hates Adam Schiff? In our audience, please raise your hand. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Hate is a strong word. Yeah, yeah it's Who like dislike? let's hate the sin yeah. and not the sinner. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Um, if you guys still remember District Thirty, it's not the first time they came up on our show. Yeah, there right. was another person that we interviewed show a couple weeks ago that showed up, and then. Because of that, we've been praying that another Republican come up who have real conservative value, who are real Christian, who is anti-abortion, who is pro-gun, who is, you know, stuff like that. And then that's how I met this guy. Right. And then I magically appeared. Yeah. So I'm like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was at a meeting. I didn't exist then, until uh, about three weeks ago. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's how great God is. No, yeah. Uh, but yeah, exactly. We met at a prayer event, PrayCalifornia.org. Yes. Uh, dot org, and uh, we met there. And yeah, I was explaining that I was running for Congress, and then you guys said we just had uh, Alex Belekian on, and I, I, I could see the pain in you guys' eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like we were praying for you, and I was, I felt the pain. In your eyes, because that's the pain that I felt as a Christian in that district. You know, this is our chance that Adam Schiff is stepping down, or he's really trying to step up into the Senate position because he's running for Senate. And then I find out that Alex is running, and he's, you know, he's a guy that the Republican Party is into. And I'm like, I can't vote for this guy. Mm -hmm. I cannot vote for him. Because he does not have my same basic values. And I know we're supposed to be all raw, raw together because we're Republican. But he, he, he himself says it very well. He's fiscally conservative and socially moderate. Well, if I could describe myself in a way as a Republican, I would say I'm fiscally moderate and socially conservative. <laughs> Right, yeah. What does that mean? Can you expand on that? If fiscally moderate means that I'm not going to die on the hill of a budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not going to die on those things. Because money is not my God. Okay. God is my God. <laughs> I will die on the hill of abortion. And then as this country returns back to value children, those economic problems, they'll actually kind of solve themselves. Because once you value life, right, mm -hmm. things like the border, which is, it's a boundary. Yes. You'll respect that boundary. You'll respect a budget limit. Because mm -hmm. right? that's what I found in my own life. You know, because I, over the years, respected life, right? I respected that moment of conception. It had this impact in my life where I actually became less and less liberal. And I was drawn more to Christ. And then when I had my moment of the Holy Spirit conviction in my life, where I was brought to my knees and faced with my sins, suddenly, next thing you know, I was getting up and going like, yeah, people do have a right to bear arms. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe we should get rid of the Fed. It doesn't sound like such an idea, a good idea now. Yeah. Right, yeah. When Alex was on our show... I actually disagree with him on a lot of the issue. Yeah, I noticed he, that when yeah. I watched it. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit about your policy and then uh, your goal 
that's you're going to be in Congress. What's the difference between you and him? Well, that's why I say I don't like to use the word policy. Okay. Policy is important because those are like the decisions that you're going to make. Yes. But before you make those decisions, right, before you put yourself on a direction, you have to look at your values. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a compass. Before you start wandering around the forest, you've got to figure out where you're going, right? You've got to know which direction you're headed in. And then you make your policy. Well, now we're going to actually, we're only going to eat half of the granola bars, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, we're going to make sure to only conserve use the flare. Waters. Yeah, we're going to conserve <laughs> the water. See, all those policy decisions come out of your values, out of the direction that you're headed. And when it comes to me and Alex Balekian, we are pointed in basically opposite directions. And really, we're just almost like placeholders for what's happening in the Republican Party right now. Mm. Right. It's happening at the state level. It's happening at the local level, of course. And it's also happening at the national level. You just saw this guy, Mike Johnson, get put in. Right. Yes. I was going to talk about it like the next question. But right. You see, you Mike Johnson got yeah. in. And first of all, you know, like Salon is saying he's he's dangerous. He's a Christian nationalist. It's like, no, he's just pointed towards Christianity. Yeah. Right. Because that's where he's getting his values from. I don't agree with everything that Mike Johnson is saying right now. Mm -hmm. But I trust the guy based on the fact that we have the same values. We're on the same direction, right? Mm -hmm. So now we can actually form some policies. It is like being lost in the forest. If I were lost in the forest with Mike Johnson, yeah, we might fight about the granola bars, but you know, we'd have to come to terms in order to survive. If I found myself in the forest with Alex Balekian, we'd be fighting about more than granola bars. We'd be fighting about which direction to go to get out of there, mm. right? I think there's a lot of a problem with the Republican Party. The Republican Party actually support Alex Blakey and a lot of what he stands for. What do you think is wrong with the Republican Party? And can you tell us a little bit about after you announce your running, what did the Republican Party do? Well, the Republican Party is so focused on the establishment. And I am so far grassroots that I was actually talking to the L.A. County GOP uh, chairman. Mm -hmm. He didn't know who I was, right? He was talking about how the important District 30 is in this next race. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, like, you've heard of the Glendale parents and the Sadekoy parents. Yes. You know, the, the Leave Our Kids Alone parents that are taken out of the street. He was talking about how that was going to give a groundswell to Republicanism. And he didn't even know who I was. So I'm like, yeah, they're not paying attention to the very grassroots that are right under their nose. Mm -hmm. And that's the rank and file who do believe in actual conservative values. So when you ask me what they think of me, they really don't pay attention. Except I will tell you, he was at an event that was a grassroots event. And I noticed that there is a little bit of a sea change because I, I, don't, I won't go into all the details because your, your audience won't care about this <laughs> necessarily. But there is a fight right now in the California Republican Party for these grassroots conservative values and these establishment uh, compromised values. Because mm -hmm. frankly, they're compromised. And going back to your other question about what's the problem with the Republican Party yes. is that the Republican Party here in this state, keeps on saying, our goal is to win. Their policy to win is to compromise their values. Mm -hmm. We just need to get more left-wing, radical left-wing votes. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to their whole worldview. They think the state is just lost, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas I believe that, no, this state actually has a large, what, what a Republican president, uh, Richard Nixon, used to call the silent majority. Yes. Which is very Christian, very conservative. But they've believed that they want to be polite and they want to be quiet because they don't want to be hateful. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Just look at their values. Their number one value is love, right? Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world, right? Like God is love. Yeah. I don't want to attack you if you have a different idea for me. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody tells me F you, to me as a Christian, that's an invitation to go try to build a relationship to bring them to salvation because <laughs> that's what we're called to, Yeah. right? Love your enemies. Yeah, I, I think um, the problem with Republican is yeah. that they gone, like what you said, they compromise so much and they think that they're going to win. Like 
Paul Ryan, uh, the ex speaker. Yeah, exactly. He's like, oh, we're going to cut taxes. And that, that's all we're going to do. I know. And e everything else, we can just go along with it. We can compromise. We can do everything. And just to cut taxes is like a Reagan economy, a Reagan Republican kind of stuff. They're afraid to use their power. They're afraid to offend people. They basically become a Democrat Party just 10 years ago. That's what I, what I think. What happened to the Republican Party? Exactly. I was having this conversation at one of these local meetings this last week where I pointed out that in 100 years, people are not going to look back and go, those Republicans, they repealed the death tax. Yeah. They finally got that death tax repealed. No, they're going to look at the big issues, which go back down to those core values. Yes. You know? It's like Abraham Lincoln. Nobody walks around and says that Abraham Lincoln, man, he really got that Homestead Act going. <laughs> Which, frankly, the Homestead Act is way more influential than repealing the death tax. I don't even, I'm not even sure what that means anymore, right? Or some big tax cut. We've had tax cuts come and go, come and go, and come and go. The Homestead Act had a huge impact. But still, even though that huge impact, nobody runs around and goes like, well, that's why we needed to build a Lincoln Memorial, because of that Homestead Act. No. <laughs> they say, jokingly even, you know, hey, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. Because that's the thing that he's remembered for. Because those are the big ticket issues. That's the problem with the Republican Party. The rank and file, the go out and die on a hill for these small, little, piddly policies in the grandiose hopes that somehow it's going to change the hearts of their countrymen, who actually, these countrymen, actually believe in their values and are willing to die on the hill for them. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen like an, a group of queer activists to the lengths that they will go to protect what they believe is right? Republicans should have that kind of same grit and glory that those queer activists have. Yeah, Republican actually forgot who, what does it mean to be a Republican? Yeah. American kind of forgot what it means to be American from what I see on the news every day. American has lost our value. We forgot about Christ. We don't know our center and then our, our goal. What, what does it mean to life, liberty? liberty and, uh, the pursuit, pursuit of, of happiness. happiness. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because that phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, is a way that I contextualize the importance of Christian values to this nation. Mm -hmm. Because if I take those three ideas, which every school child knows, right? Yeah. Every homeschool child has actually read them. Right now, the school is like a, a <laughs> yeah. equity. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're, yeah, they're trying to put equity, inclusion, and diversity. They're trying to replace those like with French Revolution and Marxist values. But no, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you take those in a Christian context, they have a different meaning. It's like a different direction than if I take them from a hedonist, mm -hmm. materialistic point of view, mm -hmm. or if I take that from a Marxist point of view. Right? If I take life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? especially the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of happiness from a very libertine, hedonistic, materialistic view is a narcissistic value where sociopaths run free, mm -hmm. right? where hedge fund billionaires cut through national economies with no care of the citizens of a foreign country, right? where people pour billions of dollars into national wars, right, so that they can fatten their pockets, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, people who, you know, are nightclubs all night long, you know. So, change who, their gender. Right, and then change their gender, and they can't figure out if they're trying to change their gender or get an abortion yeah, because their lifestyle. Men can marry men. Right. <laughs> so, see, that's where pursuit of happiness leads you in this. In a Christian framework, pursuit of happiness... Mm -hmm. leads to serving other people, mm. right? Yeah. I actually just talked about it on my show uh, a couple of days ago. It was like Aristotle right. gave us three levels of friendship, pleasure, economic-wise, and then moral-wise. So we can only have true friendship between moral people. Right, that kindness has to be both ways, yes. right? Yes, But I'm going to tell you, that kindness going both ways mm -hmm. 
has a chance when one of the persons in that relationship is kind first. We've all seen that, you know? We've seen that. I'm, I mean, I'm married. Mm-hmm. I know I can end a fight just by saying something <laughs> kind to my wife, right? In the middle of the fight. In fact, I had a fight with my wife the other day, right? About something. And we were arguing and we hadn't talked for about a day. And I, I just picked up my phone and I said, hey, I really appreciated the fact that you did this. Well, changed the whole tenor of the conversation. <laughs> okay. That's actually a good strategy. It is. Surprise them too. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, exactly. Now, I'm, I didn't have that attitude firmly planted in my heart until I brought Christ into my marriage. Right? Would, yeah. Until I realized that that old thing, because I used to be super feminist. Mm-hmm. So that old thing of a marriage is 50-50 and men and women and I'm doing half of the housework and, you know, therefore I'm a good person and I'm a good <laughs> husband and my wife, I want her to work and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and my wife didn't even take my last name. That's how much of a feminist I was. In fact, I, I would have not married her had she taken my last name, right? That was my ethic. And I destroyed my marriage with that ethic. Okay. Uh, that's how I came to Christ, actually. After that, I realized there are two people that were necessary for my marriage to be healthy. Me and Jesus. And he was going to be doing all the heavy lifting. I just had to follow his lead. And I'm going to tell you, time and time again, I see myself in positions with my wife where you're going at it, going at it. And I go, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not leading. Okay, I need to lead. Okay, wait, I need to apologize. Oh boy, that's going to be hard, right? Mm. I need to maybe just be strong or something. I I need to be a better person. And I also need to be kind to her when I do it. And by doing that, it changes. Like I said, it just just changes. It's like the atmosphere in the room changes every Mm. time I do that. So as Christians, we need to do that here in America. We haven't quite figured that out. It took me a while to figure it out just in my marriage. But I think we have to do that here in our culture in order to get the culture back. Yeah, indeed. Put Christ in our family. We, we absolutely have to do that. We have to double down into our values. And that's the problem I have, again, going back to the Republicans, is we keep on compromising. They keep on saying things like, well, no, we have to run candidates like Alex because we have to win. We're going to win. This is how we're going to win the state back. Yeah. And I'm like... That's not winning. Yeah. That's sinning, you know? Yeah. Because, especially when it comes to abortion, one of the biggest victories that conservatives and Republicans have had, conservative Republicans have had, in the last 50 years is the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. Every Republican politician since I've been a child has been promising that. Mm -hmm. Only one man delivered that. Donald J. Donald Trump. J. Trump. <laughs> a man who, a man who most people would not go like, oh yeah, this guy, he's like a Christian. This guy's a 100% Christian. We, we all remember famously him holding up that Bible like he had held it up the first time, right? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, that guy, somehow, he got steeped in Christian values Yeah. regarding abortion. That surprised everyone. Well, right. Actually, there, there are a few clips that came out, and he criticized Ron DeSantis because of the six-week ban and everything. And then people would start saying that, ah, see, he did all that, and he criticized this, and he actually went on a show. He says, like, uh, because the Ron DeSantis did a bad job, it was a horrible thing, uh, we should have abortion. There's a number we should talk about. What do you think about that uh, on Donald Trump? Well, I think Donald Trump, this is where the weakness comes in. Donald Trump is a great guy. He is like a great leader who went all the way. Yes. But he has Achilles, he, an Achilles heel. Yes. I think everybody can see that he didn't know how to surround himself with people. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, he's a guy who has a strong will and he has strong values but I don't think he's in touch with those values as strongly as he could be. Actually, I, I pray that one day Donald Trump will come out and just be like on fire for Jesus. Yeah. At that point, I'll be like, oh, God, okay. Whew. America's uh, finally safe. America, America. We just, the, <laughs> I'll be like, oh, okay, wow, I never saw that coming. 
Right. So it's a thing of, um, you, again, you can't compromise because I've seen it. Like he's he's also been very light on gay marriage. Yes. Like when it comes to gay marriage. And he it's had like a party in Mar- Mar-a-Lago. I know. We've all, we, yeah, we've heard of the famous party at Mar-a-Lago. But it's a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. You know what? The Republican Party had an opportunity to stand behind people mm-hmm. in the past. They could have stood behind Rick Santorum in 2012. Mm-hmm. I was really for that guy. Okay. Yeah. No, that guy got sidelined because Mitt Romney came, right? Yeah. And I, I remember there being in the, at the caucus. The first time I went to a caucus, I was living in Colorado at the time. And they got up, and you could see that there was passion behind Rick Santorum. But there was this establishment Republican uh-huh. base that was like, no, no, we have to win. I'm like, we have to win. We have to win. What do you mean, what do you mean by winning? Win? What do you mean by winning? Does this have something to do with your bank account? <laughs> this is what I'm starting to believe. Like, you don't really care about abortion. You care about money. Yeah. That's what you care about. Oh, in fact, one woman got up and she goes, and we need to have uh, Mitt Romney's wife. I can't remember her name now. We have to have her. We don't want that kind of woman Barack Obama has to be in the White House. I'm like, okay, ma'am, um, now you just sound racist. Now you sound racist and you love money, right? Because Barack Obama, I mean, you know, I, some people say Barack Obama's wife, is, is his new, real name is Michael. I don't know. I haven't seen that. But just, but you know what? I didn't know that. I don't know Mitt Romney's wife either. I don't know how great she is. Yeah. So, but I was just supposed to go along with the Republican politics because, you know, because we we're going to win. Meanwhile, Santorum, the guy who's actually standing up, the guy who said, you know, hey, guys, if we don't stand up for, uh, against gay marriage now, people are going to be marrying dogs. And then, sure enough, 11 years later, we've got kids uh, having uh, kitty litter boxes at schools. Uh, hello? Right? But do you know what the gay, the queer community did to Rick Santorum? No, please tell. Okay. They knew that this guy was such a threat. There was a guy named Dan Savage. Okay. He was a big queer activist, uh, although he labels himself a a sexual uh, therapist or something like that. So he went out and he created an online campaign to turn the word Santorum into something that was vulgar so that when people, like average church ladies, would Google Santorum, what, what the Google... Uh, rankings that would come up or the Google results that would come up were filthy. And sure enough, if you've got the stomach for it, Google Santorum. And I won't tell you this because you probably don't want your audience to to shut off and, and you know put the kids in the closet. But if you Google Santorum, it is the most disgusting definition that they added to his name. Is that so? I didn't yes. know that. Yeah. I never Googled Santorum before. Yeah, poor Rick Santorum. This guy just got sidelined by the Republicans. He got sidelined. So that was 2012. And then what happened in 2012? Did we see some of that winning? No. Yeah, did we have that big victory? No. Mitt Romney? I kept being told that I had to vote for Mitt Romney because he was a very good, strong Christian man. I was like, no, he's Mormon. <laughs> he's Mormon. <laughs> you know, I'm open to voting for a Mormon, but just don't tell me he's a Christian. Yeah. Don't tell me that he, like... I respect Mormons enough to t- say that, um, in fact, LDS, that's the new term, okay? So I will respect the LDS church enough to say that they say they're not Christian like I define Christianity. Yeah. So why are you pulling that card on me to s- for me to vote for this guy? I'm, no. Yeah, don't no. pull the Christian card. Don't pull the Christian card on me. Because if I'm going to vote for, Barack Obama said he was a Christian. Uh-huh. Hillary Clinton said she was a Christian. Joe Biden is a good Catholic who goes to Mass every week. (laughs) Right? So if you're going to pull that card on me, don't expect me to just fall in line because you want to win at the cost of my values. The Christian values. Christian values that are shared still with the majority of this country. Okay? We still have hope, but the Christians that are not politically active, the Christians that have written off this nation, I'm going to tell you, they're the ones that, you know, when God says, hey, what did you do with this beautiful nation that your forefathers built? Mm -hmm. 
And they'll be like, well, you know, I, I didn't want to speak up. I didn't want to. I didn't. Well, like she said, look, you didn't have to yell at people. You just had to get smarter. Like I did in my marriage, you know? Change. I, yeah. I believe that these hard times that we're living in are a blessing. Uh -huh. They're a blessing to the church to become more disciplined. Love that. Love yeah. That. yeah. This is, we, we should be rejoicing. It says that. Mm -hmm. Right. We see a lot of weak churches, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. A right. lot of them just closed down, and everything. And now, the the churches who closed down are actually suffering. People just don't go back to their church, or they just find another church that that's open. So I think, like what you said, Christians, we need to persist. We need to be. Right. We, we need to stand for our value. We need to stand behind the Bible, not just listen to all these crazy people just tell us like, if we do this, we if we compromise, if we just give up Jesus on this subject, if we just don't go to church on Sunday, right? We will win. We'll, we'll, we'll beat we'll the win. virus. We're gonna beat the virus. <laughs> exactly. That is such a good, a good analogy. Of the church, everybody thought, oh, we'll just beat the virus if we don't go to church. You know what? I did not lock down one day. Mm -hmm. They said they were going we to lock down two weeks. I was like, mm, I don't think so. Um, I literally, I, didn't, I did not lock down one single day. Yeah. I, went, I remember it was March 15th or March 16th, <laughs> right? I went to my office. There was a big sign on the, on the door. You know, this office is going to be this and that, and the public can't come in here. And I said, well, I will be coming into this office because they're not going to lock me down. Because I know that this lockdown is not about that virus. Do you know how I knew that? How? Two things, right? Two experiences I had. The first was I had COVID. I had COVID <laughs> in December of 2019. Oh, you were the very first one <laughs> no i wasn't the very first one there was a whole outbreak on the west coast i would run into people all the time who would be like yeah i had covid like in uh, like in february of 2019 <laughs> you're, you're part right? of the patient zero group <laughs> no no, it, no well it, no that was the crazy thing is it wasn't it, well i'm gonna tell you yeah patient zero that's the thing is that i knew if these guys really cared about the science they would be looking for patient zero they would anybody who said they had covid symptoms they would be pulling into a lab if this was the most dangerous virus ever to f show its face even though viruses don't have faces to show its face on this planet then they would be finding people who had covid symptoms and anybody who had said i have covid they would be looking at that data and crunching it instead the official response was no there's no way you could have had covid yeah. No, you couldn't have had COVID. No. And I'm, I'm like, well, okay. So my wife had COVID too, and she had a bad cough for about a month in January. And, um, and it was weird because on Christmas Day, a friend of mine gave me some steaks. And by the way, I was so sick that we were actually eating Christmas dinner at home. I was supposed to travel up to the Bay Area to see my... But I also had a bad cough, and I was really sick. And I had caught that cough on a movie set where everybody else was coughing, and everybody was really tired. Anyway, back to my wife. Uh, she says, uh, you know, this steak, I don't know why it's so fancy. I can't taste it. <laughs> Mic drop. Right? We all had COVID. In fact, in February, my sister was in an ICU room in Chicago where my whole family got together to say goodbye to her right? Because she was dying. And uh, in retrospect, uh, I think she had COVID, yeah. you know, and they had her on a ventilator. And they said she had, when she was dying, she had little mini strokes and, you know, and it was a horrible infection in her lungs. Now she also had late stage cancer and oh, diabetes. Okay. Oh, wow. So nobody, again, people were not like, wait a t time out. Maybe this lady has COVID and maybe we can study her to see how we can stop the virus. Exactly. No, the response was, no, every small business in America now has to shut its doors. Yeah. And every school has to shut down yeah. because of science. Yeah, that's what happened to my wife too. My wife is the first one, one of the first one in our family to get COVID. And then she was pregnant that time. And then uh, she's just gonna go off to uh, do her maternity check and everything. And they just go like, and she, she just found out that she had COVID. And the hospital just tell her, oh, just stay home. 
there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> just stay home. There's nothing we yeah. can do about it. Yeah, and and then uh, just stay home for two weeks and then uh, come back in two weeks, and that's it. There was no emergency. They didn't come out and fix it, and they, they didn't send a doctor to go like, okay, we gotta study this virus. They just go, just stay home. So that's when I realized like hey, maybe this is just full of BS. Well, well, the other thing I noticed, <laughs> so the BS thing was ballot harvesting. Yeah. I knew that if they could keep people at home, they'd be it'd be easier to, and more important to ballot harvest. And I noticed ballot harvesting was an issue because in 2018, all these congressional seats in Orange County magically flipped from red to blue uh-huh. overnight. Mm-hmm. And it was because of ballot harvesting, right? Mm-hmm. And then I remembered that when I was I was living in Colorado in 2013, they rolled out mail-in balloting out there. Mm-hmm. I was uh, living with my mother-in-law at the time. And uh, so I was looking around for my ballot to vote. And I asked my mother-in-law, have you seen it? And she goes, uh, she's a Democrat, by the way. She goes, uh, I took care of it. Whoa, okay. <laughs> and I went, she voted for you? I think she voted for me, but I, I kind of blew it off because it was, you know, I'm not going to call the police on my, on my mother-in-law, obviously. So that was the other thing I saw is I said, oh, they're, they're just going to use this whole uh, shutdown as an excuse to ballot harvest. And then lo and behold, nine months later, there's been a, a fraudulent election. And when the vaccine came, I was like, this is weird. Because now they're requiring everybody to follow the vaccine. We all know that Big Pharma is making a billion bucks on these vaccines. You know, now we've got this whole other issue of people, you know, that are vaccine injured, right? But at the root of it, I'm going to tell you, why were they so willing to do that? To shut down an economy, to ballot harvest, to get Donald Trump out of office. Mm Mm-hmm. Roe v. Wade. You know, so much, if you just follow, like the old phrase, follow the money, Mm -hmm. follow, just follow the money. But more importantly, follow the values. Where do the values take you? Roe v. Wade, that's the number one reason I believe that the left wanted Donald Trump out of office. Oh, is that so? That's a... Yeah, because who was the guy that eventually overturned Roe v. Wade? It's Donald Trump. Yeah, and the left knew that, that that was his biggest threat. The United States cannot sacrifice children as a country. As a country, right. But California can still sacrifice children as a state. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing with the Republican Party. The Republican Party platform right now basically says that the constitutional amendment that the people of California passed last year yeah. is okay. Yeah. Because they believe in states' rights. I'm like, oh, I remember the last time that this country had an argument about states' rights. And then it only got solved when Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, just pay attention. Everything comes around. But in order to really pay attention and see the truth, you got to see where your North Star is. Mm. And that's why it comes down to values, values, values. What's your uh, message to your voters and to tell them that you need to vote for me this time, you need to vote for our value, you need to be Christian. So what I would say actually is, look, if you are Christian, first of all, you have an obligation. You have an obligation. I, I believe you have a biblical obligation to vote. And why is that? Because we are supposed to respect authority. That's Romans 13. Mm-hmm. And our founders did something very interesting to us. They took the authority from the king, right? And they didn't steal it. That's what the whole Declaration of Independence was about. It, it, they, they had a due process that they followed, and they had a little thing called the Revolutionary War, right? And then and at the end of result, though, is that they came up with we the people. Mm-hmm. Well, we the people, that means that we have the authority. That means if we the people are not doing something, especially as Christians, we are not, we're not being biblically obedient, so that's the first thing, is if you are a Christian, you are not registered to vote, you do not have somebody to vote for, you're not at least studying things, you need to do that, I think. You have God's call on your life to be a mature adult, a mature Christian, a mature citizen, right? Until you are a citizen of heaven, you are a citizen of the United States of America. And God has put you in that position. So take that responsibility very seriously. 
That's the first thing I would say. The other thing I would say to people who are not Christian is this nation was founded on Christian values, okay? If you are benefiting from those Christian values because you care about the free market system, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a Christian value. It's there in Jesus' parables. He's not a socialist, like people say, right? Mm -hmm. But if you care about things like the free market, if you care about the family and the stability of the family and realize that the family is the fundamental building block of society, then, then it's important. The way that marriage is designed in this, that you know, pre-gay marriage was designed, was designed with the family in mind. That's a Christian value. And the final thing is that in our constitution, our constitution is loaded up with Christian values. In fact, the values in the Constitution, to help this country grow and prosper, they're Christian values. The values that were not Christian caused this country a lot of problems, like the Three-Fifths Compromise. You're familiar with the Three-Fifths Compromise? Yeah. That was an unholy Christian compromise. And that's the and only reason that we're still getting attacked right now. We are Black still... Black Lives Matter. Exactly. We are still beholden to the lies of a, fasc a fascist Marxist organization like Black Lives Matters, because our founders, who were Christian, or at least embedded in Christian values, see, they compromised. Yeah. They compromised on that three-fifths aberration, right, which is a totally unchristian view. That's what they did, and we're still living with it. So if we want our descendants to not have to live with the same kind of problems, because who knows what it'll be in a hundred years? Question mark lives matter, right? Well, we won't know. Could be pedophile lives matters, right? Which, as a Christian, they do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, their, their soul matters. Their soul matters. Yeah, yeah. But they still need to go to prison because there's actions have consequences. I was a sinner. Mm -hmm. I did bad things. Mm. And Jesus came and he got me. Mm -hmm. Like the little lamb that was separated from the 99, he came and got me. Okay. And that's what Christians have to do. Even as we take responsibility with our voting, right? When we go out to protests, you know, when we uh, get active in politics. Just like what Emilio said, if you're a Christian, it is your civil duty and it is your godly, God-given right to be a voter in this country and then in this in your district if you want to save your district if you want to save a little bit of what you have in your house in your family in your children put some sane idea into your family into your school now is the time to change and now is the time to fight back what they are doing it's no time to compromise and it's really sad that we think that in order for us to win, we have to compromise. Yeah, this is not the season of compromise. In fact, what's gotten us into this season is, is too much compromise. Yeah. So uh, thank you guys for watching. And can you tell us a little bit about your district again? Can you name your district and city? Uh, district, California, Congressional District 30, currently held by Adam Schiff, but he's no longer going to be in there. Glendale, Burbank, Los Feliz, Silver Lake, uh, Hollywood, West Hollywood, Mid Wilshire, and then back up to Tahunga and Sunland. All right. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, my name is Ethan. And remember this guy. J. Emilio Martinez. <laughs> And if you go to voteemilio.com, it'll take you to my website. So vote Emilio. Mm. And right. uh, how can they help you? Uh, your, donate to your campaign and then uh, be your volunteer. How do they? Well, right now I need to get fundraising. And, and right now I also want to get this message out there, right? I want to get this message out there that we have to realize that the republic has died. And the only thing that's going to bring it back is Jesus. Yeah, and I call it the American Resurrection. Because Amer American <laughs> Revolution 2.0, American Civil War 2.0, the insurrection, it's not going to save us. This country died of COVID, it died of fentanyl overdoses, it died at the border, you know, it's died of genital mutilation. 
You know, it's di- it died on the fields of Afghanistan and Iraq. It has died, right? It died on January 6th. And o- the only thing that will bring it back is a resurrection, an American resurrection. So this is what I say. As a Christian, believe in the resurrection. As an American, believe in the resurrection, right? And that's what we have to do. We have to spread this word to other Christians that they need to get out there and do something because they are the conscience of this nation. And if they do not be and live in that role of being the conscience of this nation, then we don't have a nation anymore. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for the smart word. And I I love this conversation between us. This This is amazing. Thank you guys for watching AI News. This is Ethan and... J. Emilio Martinez. And I will see you guys next time.